There you go. So everybody, please give a, a round of applause to Massimiliano. So good morning, everyone. Am I near enough? Yes, OK. So I talk about Rust on robots. Now, something short about myself, things I worked on. I, I'm mostly a compiler engineer. I work on the mono just in time compiler for six years, then in the Unity game engine for one year, in the V8 team in Google for one year and a half, and now I do virtual reality on the web in Hyperfair, and uh, it's fun. But now let's talk about this talk first. So I start telling stories about how I actually ended up using Rust on robots. Because the story is important, because so you understand the motivations what actually happened. And I'll show a couple of examples. And then I, I'll say something about what's special about Rust on robots. And it will be pretty simple, because the, the software is very, very simple. And also because, in the end, me and Rust, well, it's not like that much. So uh, long ago, I liked the concepts that I liked at time. And I was fearing the learning curve, you know, borrow checker, anyone. And so I just was watching Rust from a distance. That, that was it. And then about robots. And again, I liked them in principle, of course, but again, I liked time. And then we saw a Lego Sumo competition. Uh, it was me and my son, well, also my wife. He was 12. And it was Lava for Sight. I mean, it was really fun. And so we started building our robot to compete in these competitions. And to give some perspective, I'm talking about hobby projects, mostly done with Lego, so essentially toys. And four competitions, which is fun because then you are forced to do them better. So you are doing something simple, but then you say, oh, crap, I'm losing this match. Why? And then you want to do something better. And uh, these competitions that I'm talking about is mostly sumo and line follower. So a sumo match is something like this. You've got two opponents on a small arena, and uh, they start, and they are autonomous, and they try to use a strategy to push the other out. <laughs> so th this is what you should expect. And the line follower is a small thing that follows a line. You know, and the, the goal is to do it fast. So w the one that wins is the one that does it faster. So they are timed. And uh, now, over the years, uh, we actually uh, built a team, because there's this guy here, which is the most experienced one. He was winning competition all the time, organizing one in Italy. We participated to the one he was organizing, then became friends. And then there's my wife, my son, another father with his son. This one is his son. Now another family joined. And next week, we will be in Estonia, Tallinn, for a gigantic event with hundreds of robots. We'll be, we'll be bringing 30 ourselves. Uh, so we are really having a lot of fun. So back to the story, our first Lego robot. We, we had to program this thing. And the Lego kit comes with a visual environment. Now, the visual environment is fine for kids, but it's very limiting when you want to do something more complex. My kid understood that, so we wanted to switch to a real programming language. Now, the, the Lego thing uh, runs Linux inside. Big like this, no, 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 just, it's big like this. This is the small, com the small computer, so it's Lego. And um, uh, so it runs Linux, and there is an operating system which is EV3 Dev. EV3 is the name of the CPU, the, the, the Lego kit. And EV3 Dev is a Debian port on this. So you have a Debian, you can SSH into it, you can use whatever you want. And our first language was Node.js, JavaScript, because we wanted to keep it simple. Then there was problem with the libraries, so we switched to Python. And then the robot worked. We qualified in a competition. But uh, we realized that it was not interacting properly. I mean, it was slow. So I was blaming the language. Uh, <laughs> but it's Python. I mean, it's not fast. We all know. So I didn't want to inflict memory management onto my son. So I said, OK. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> so my idea was Golang. Golang is very simple as a language. It's compiled to native code. And it worked. But somebody said, let there be latency in the world. And there was latency. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is that doing things takes time. And time can be significant. And our robots did not react in time. So we, we built a latency tester. Now, this latency tester has 
panels passing in front of a proximity sensor that drives a line that is sensed by a sensor. So the time it takes for the signal to propagate from these sensors to the actuator to be perceived, it's the time that the machine is taking to process an event and react. So this is a simulator of the latency that the robot is actually experiencing while working. I had to be scientific because I, I, I really wanted to understand what was going on. I mean, this is obviously a toy, but it served a purpose. It was a scientific experiment. And uh, the problem was we measured something like 50 millisecond latency spikes. Is it much? Is it not much? We are talking about hard real time, but what does it mean? Well, hard real time is not about performance by its own sake. It's about time-related correctness, which means predictable latency. And to give examples related to robotics, think about a self-driving car on a highway. A bit more than 100 kilometers per hour is 30 meters per second. And at this speed, 100 milliseconds is three meters. So if by any means that software is 100 millimeter milliseconds late, you lose three meters of running, which is not good, probably. I say, OK, this is a car. What about our toys? OK, take a line follower robot. Let's say it's doing two meters per second. Then 10 milliseconds is 20 millimeters. And since the line is smaller than 20 millimeters, if you have a blind spot of 10 milliseconds, you just risk to miss a sharp turn and go out of the track. So this is the kind of latency you should aim at, generally millisecond or sub-millisecond latency, if you want to be serious. Now, the root of the problem actually was not the language. I was very conscious when I was writing Golang. I did, essentially never did allocations. The garbage collector wasn't there anyway. Uh, so it was just machine code. It was fast. The problem was the OS. So in that operating system, the, it was a Linux kernel, an ancient one, without preempt RT. And there's this ARMv5 chip, which has a, a cache addressing scheme. I don't want to delve into the details, but the problem is at every context switch, the operating system is forced to flush the whole cache, which is painful. Uh, so what can we do? I say, OK, let's try a new operating system. We found out there is this EV3 RT, which is a small real-time kernel that has been ported on the Lego brick by a Japanese team. And uh, it, it's there on the internet. And it was amazing, sub-milliseconds max latencies. And the, the event loop was running on more than 10 kilohertz. So 10 times per millisecond you could measure things. I mean, we were extra happy. The documentation was entirely in Japanese, just <laughs> tiny bits of English. <laughs> and user code must be written in C. There's no other SDK, essentially. So my son got sad because of the C language. You know, he was already very proficient in Golang and said, what's this mess? Do you have to care about pointers, the references? What, what's this thing? And so this is, I said, OK, let's look at Rust. This was actually a perfect excuse for me for learning Rust. And it's actually a perfect fit because there is no GC, the, there is predictable latency, there is high performance, and it is perfect CABI interoperability, which means that it's a perfect drop-in replacement for C in essentially any environment. So I started with baby steps. I entered no STD land, which means uh, that's, you want to keep it small. You don't want to have dependencies. I didn't want to have memory allocation anyway because you know, for timing reasons, size reasons, and everything. So I selected the RV5 target, which is actually pretty well supported. And the proof of concept was a single Rust files compiled directly with the compiler, Rust C, not even Cargo. And it was replacing a single C object file with one single function and link it together. And well, it worked. That was very simple. You know, a function that adds one to a number, it's simple, but it worked. Then I, I did the, the bulk of the job, which was integrated that with the operating system. There were a few small challenges, like no simple syscall ABI, uh, because the syscall ABI was this thing that was difficult to emulate in Rust. But then the solution is simply to wrap the syscall I need with C functions and link onto them. It's very simple to do. Then the binary file format for the executable was really tricky because it was an ELF format, but with a custom layout that they selected. And so I just reused the C SDK linker script. I changed nothing. So in practice, what I do is uh, to compile my application create as a static library in Rust. And then 
have a C application in this operating system and link the static library into that application, providing essentially the main entry point. So there is this application in this operating system that calls my main entry point in Rust, and from that point on, it's just Rust land calling back into the library function in C. It's really pretty simple. And it started working, but working then linked files became too big. So it's something like one megabyte of code, and I said, why does it do one megabyte of code? And then I tried various strategies with the linker to limit the, the scope of the code, throwing away what was not needed, but every time I touched the linking process, I was breaking the build. It was very, very hard to produce an executable file that was okay for that operating system to load. Then I said, okay, I have no other choice. I'll recompile libcore, stripping things by hand. I was really determined to have it running. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I, I started with Xargo, which is a tool that you use in embedded land. Uh, this is actually mostly a talk of Rust in embedded land. So robotics is an excuse to say embedded land. And with Xargo, there were linking issues. Then I used another tool, which is called Cargo X Build, which is a plugin to Cargo that recompiles libcore and another couple of basic libraries on the fly for you, for your target. And the funny thing was that using this and recompiling libcore on the fly solved the issue magically. It was half the size. Don't ask me why. So it worked. Which means now I want to show you something, just concretely, so that we have a, a fun. So I don't know how much this is visible, but this thing is running Rust code. It has a small UI. I can select another function, and it is measuring the error of the sensor. If I move it, you maybe see the digits moving. Uh, just go closer down. OK, if I move this, then go to the LCD. Ah, uh, crap, the illumination is terrible. OK, you see that there are numbers moving. It's actually measuring the error on the line. And there are bars moving. So this I cannot make it run because I don't have the track. Then there is this boy. Look at the LCD. There is the strategy. I can pick another strategy, which is circle around and uh, go to the center. And can say, prepare to run. Now it will start. And it should execute the strategy and then look for an opponent in, in two, one second start. OK. <laughs> Demo effect. Start again, five seconds. Three, two, one, go. Circle, look for opponent. Here is the opponent. <laughs> look for me. Now it, it actually saw me, <laughs> which <laughs> OK, so you see it reacts, it works. And this is Rust. So it's a toy, but it's been really fun. <laughs> so. Now, a different story. I, how much time do I have left, by the way? Uh, how much time? Is I it 15 minutes? minutes? Or something. Okay, so this one, I'll cut it a bit shorter because it is a bit of a sad story, unfortunately. I had this other robot, which is uh, a, a, another toy. This is pre made, it's for kids. It's a one robot per child platform. And um, it's, Ar it's M bot, it's Arduino inside, so an IVR CPU. And we wanted to use this in a competition as well. Uh, so, I said, so I said, OK, let's use Rust on that, which means Rust on AVR. And th the spoiler alert is this does not really have a happy ending. It doesn't fully work, and I want just to tell you why. So let's cut it short about the troublesome things I had to do to actually make it run. 
So there were lots of Rust hurdles. You have to build your own Rust compiler from an unstable fork with an unstable LLVM fork. And the build environment is sometimes critical. I was looking for an environment more stable uh, using a container. Then when I had it running, the main library resumed work and did useful thing that I wanted to use. And so I rebuilt the compiler again and catching up. In the end, I had an hello world again. And when I had an hello world working, I wanted to actually write code for the robot. And then I had ecosystem issues because essentially the basic instruction would work. I had serial ports, timers, and I could use individual pins on the chip. But the problem is anything else. And then I'll talk about robot hardware. So what, do you, what are you interacting with? And if you just need to do simple read write on pins, then it's simple. So you just use the registers and you write to the pins and uh, that's fine. Now, if, you, if uh, you have timers, so you can generate square waves, which is PWM, to drive continuous current motors and eventually servos. So that thing, you can get it working in Rust easily because it's just a few register writes. You have hardware rewards, so you have serial lines. So eventually you could talk to, to smart sensors if they had a serial interface. But however, in this thing, it is a real world thing. This hardware, it has motors and a button which are okay, PWM and a single analog read on a pin. It has ultrasound sensors. And you can see it from a distance. I mean, the, there's no need to, to the camera. If I switch it on, then you can see that it senses proximity. This is an ultrasound sensor. And uh, it's easy to do because in the end, uh, it's just a pin where you have to write a high signal to, uh, to push the sound. And then you have to read the signal to, and time the time it takes for the sound to come back. So you have to time it, but it's not hard. The problem is anything else. Because for anything else, you have to do what is called bit banging. Anybody know what bin bit banging is? It's when you are actually implementing a protocol on a pin, writing high and low bits on the pin by hand using code. And the, the RGB light on that thing works on a single pin for two, le for two RGB LEDs, and the protocol has something like 800 nanosecond precision pulses. And the, the, the mainstream audio library, Arduino library, it essentially, it's a pile of macros and finely tuned in line assembly, which only works because of the speed of the clock of the CPU. And their reading from the line sensor on the front is similar. And the problem is that, back to Rust, writing this in Rust is feasible. You put in line assembly in Rust with macros and everything, but well, it's, it's not pleasant. Uh, so I decided, well, it's tricky. I try to reuse the C code. Now. Mixing Rust and Arduino turned out to be incredibly hard. I tried both ways, so both taking an Arduino sketch with a Rust library inside and a Rust application linking the Arduino library. In both cases, I had linking issues, runtime issues, not found symbols, uh, too large executable. So I ended up saying, okay, it's just too hard. Now, I, I'm just keeping my thought is that Rust does work on a VR in this unstable branch. It's still a bit painful to use. The ecosystem is not there because on Arduino, much of the value is the ecosystem. You find libraries for everything. And it helps a lot. Now, if you want to start a, a Rust project on Arduino, think about it. What do you want to do? Do you want to work on the platform or do you want to get something done? Because if you want to get something done, you will have a lot to do. Th that's the message. It's not bad in itself, you just need to you know. Now, C integration is probably useful, but really tricky. Mine is maybe just bad timing. Eventually, Rust AVR will be merged in mainline, probably, so maybe things will get better. But for now, it's this. So let's turn page. And let's talk about, uh, uh, for now, I have told stories, but uh, what about Rust? So I use Rust. What does it mean to use Rust in these things? And is it helping? And well, yes, it does. And the, the longer answer is it depends on how you structure your code and what you're after. So the simplest way to write 
uh, a logic for this thing is what people call the mega loop. It's essentially a big loop that does read data from sensors, think something, and act on actuators. Do it again. And you have to do it fast enough that it looks like real time. This is what I was calling the event loop before. This is the simplest possible approach. It's what actually Arduino encourages, because it works. It's very easy to reason about. It's totally imperative, imperative of course, but that's fine. It's a small, simple thing. Expanded, it looks like this. You know, you have read that gives you data, then think that takes the data, takes probably a state, and gives you the new state and commands to execute, and then act that uses the commands to do things. This is the, the main thing. Now, you can ma write it more C-like with uh, passing things by reference with mutations. And in the end, being realistic, it ends up like this, mutating things everywhere. Why? Because essentially, when you, everything is stateful. Because when you are reading data, often you need to do timings because you need to measure the speed of things which means you need to remember the past values and the next ones, and sometimes you are doing averages among values to taper off uh, spikes uh, or spurious reads, which means that the reading system is not stateless. So it needs to have data in, data out anyway. And uh, about the command system, quite often you don't want to do all the possible actuations every time. You only want to change what changed for performance reasons, especially on the graphic LCD but sometimes also on physical things, which means that you need to know the state of the thing now and uh, compute what changed and only actuate what changed, which means essentially every subsystem is stateful. Now you can think object-oriented and write it like this, where we have this reader, this state, and this actuator, which are stateful objects, and then uh, the data that, that works is immutable actually, so you take just the immutable data out of the reader, pass that to the thinker, that mutates the state, but gives you an immutable command, and then you give the command to the actuator. This is one way to think about it. Or you can think in functional pseudocode. You, you, you see this will not compile, but you get the idea. So essentially passing value back and front every time. And the, the funny thing is, be happy. Because all these styles are fine. It's just your choice. And the borrow checker is helping you either way. Now, the nice thing, I showed you these different styles, but Rust gives you a choice. You can either write code that, well, is not purely functional, but say its single function is a pure function. And it actually, probably, quite likely, uh, since the compiler will do a lesion of the moves, it will perform like C-like code that is memory sharing. So the code that I was showing before, when you pass value in, value out, you pass the ownership, the compiler is very likely to optimize the move out, to say, okay, this is just this value, so why should I have to copy it in and out? So you write very high level code, and the resulting machine code is high performance. Or you can say, okay, I write it C style. So I pass references all the time, even mutable references, but this C style code, it, it is C style on the surface, but in practice, the, the borrow checker is enforcing that you don't do silly things. So uh, you can only mutate something one, one, uh, one piece of code at a time. You cannot share mutable things and so on. So in the end, it doesn't really matter. You pick your style, and Rust is helping you. Now, realistically, the tinker function will become complex. And becoming complex, it will need to be modularized. So you need to do some kind of splitting up. There are several strategies to, to make this think function. It can be a very big match statement, so, or it can be a function pointer that changes from time to time, so you actually are calling a different function from time to time. Or you can have many separated sub-loops, so you execute one sub-loop to do an activity, and another loop to do another activity, and another loop to do another activity. I tried probably all of them, and you can just pick what you feel most sensible, each one will work. Macros could help in the subloops, but again, be happy because the Rust type system is helping a lot. What I found out is that the state can be an enum, so it can have different shapes, which means that 
according to what your robot is doing to the context, it is perfectly clear what kind of information it has in the state and what it can and cannot do on that. So usually, when you have a data structure in a language like C, it is something like freeform memory representation. So yes, it is structured, but in practice, you can do whatever you want. You have to be very disciplined. While in Rust, if you design up front the shape of your state, then it's very hard to do mistake in the think function because you do pattern matching on the state and it's clear if it's either one thing or the other or the other. Uh, it's really, really hard to do mistakes. As I said, exhaustive pattern matching. So it's, in my opinion, better than playing C and C++. So are we done? And I say, not really. We still have this single mega loop. And uh, this means that the response time, the latency, is constrained by the loop complexity. So essentially, you process things at the speed of the loop. If you wanted to process things at different speeds, the code would be mm, not so good. And all the complexity is ultimately inside a single function. It can be decomposed hierarchically, but in the end, it's a single invocation. Now, can we do better? And um, the idea is that we would need a multitasking system. However, this means a scheduler, and a scheduler normally means overhead, and you don't want overhead. It's the small embedded system. So, and also, it needs to be a real-time scheduler. So it feels not bare metal anymore. But there's this project called RTFM, which would, means real-time for the masses. <laughs> I would like to thank Jorge Aparicio. I hope I pronounced the name well. I met him in Paris in the last Rust Fest. And uh, this is a hardware scheduler. So it's a Rust library or framework or crate or whatever. It's a, it's a crate. And it's a hardware scheduler that is interrupt driven, which means every task actually starts because of an interrupt, a physical interrupt on the machine, and runs to completion, but they can overlap. And the nice thing is that uh, it has sub-microsecond overhead because it's hardware level. And it has fearless concurrency. Because, uh, OK, now a concrete example. Remember this M-Bot, this, this robot with the ultrasound. Reading the ultrasound takes time. You have to send the pulse and wait for the reply. What if you wanted to do something in the middle? Sometimes it takes something like one millisecond and a half to wait for this echo. I wanted to do something else. So the idea would be I should fire an interrupt when I get the reply. But then this means that the, the interrupt routine will have to mutate something that maybe I was using. So this can get tricky. And uh, OK, this, this I said with voice. And the, the magic of RTFM is that it uses the Rust type system and the phantom markers, which is, I mean, the values without sides, but with particular types that are inserted in the data structure so that they can be marked with particular features. And then essentially, it will prove at compile time that there are no concurrency problems in the accesses, which means that your interrupts will fire and will modify things, and you will be OK. And in my opinion, this is very, very nice magic that should be experimented more. As far as I know right now, it is only on ARM Cortex M and, and Linux, but that, that doesn't count. And I'll explain why. And this brings me to ARM Cortex M. This is where the real action is. So I showed you toys on difficult platforms. But if you want to do something embedded, just go here. Rust support is first class. It just works. Right now, you don't even need another linker. So the, the embedded linker shipped with Rust will work for your embedded target. And maybe start with a tool called Bobbin, which is a common line to do compilation of projects, but you can even do that without. And what if you want to do use Linux with your robots, with Rust? Well, then Rust support is perfect. I mean, it's, the development experience is so easy. It's just a, your host operating system on the target. The problem is the real-time scheduler. So at that point, you will be either use preempt RT and fight with Linux real-time a lot, or stick to soft real-time. Another design could be put the hard real-time logic in a small embedded controller, program it with bare metal. And if you have something fancy, like image recognitions or whatever, put that on a high-level ARM board, like a Raspberry Pi. And when you get data, you feed the, the commands in real-time with a serial line 
to, to the real-time task, and then probably this is a more sensible design, in, in my opinion. So to sum it up, I say that Rust on robots is great. It even runs on Lego bricks right now, which is amazing. And the language performs at least as well as C. And the abstractions help you build better software. So that's all. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, hold on, one at a time. <laughs> so, questions about how Rust will kill all humans? Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, you did a lot of re research in how this all works with the compilers and crates and stuff. Is there any resource where you wrote down all this so others can catch up to it? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, there's only this talk because I did the research in a hurry because my real goal was not just this conference, but the competition in one week. <laughs> uh, so what I want to do is to publish most of the code that I've brought. So right now I work in a, let's say, a workspace with crates all in the same repository. I want to split the crates so that the, the generic support, platform support crates will be published, and the robot code, well, not really because it doesn't make sense. And also because the other members of my teams will just not be happy about it. I'll probably share it, but it's, anyway, it's just robot-specific code. So probably what will happen is that I will do this split and publish the crates like that. Hi, great talk. Uh, were you able to get uh, interrupts to work on AVR with Trust? Um, I didn't even try because uh, the, the hardware platform that I was using uh, essentially is, has been designed for kids, not for... Uh, uh -huh, okay. So it has the, the things on the different, on the wrong pins, which means that I could not use this thing for the ultrasound. Uh -huh. And AVR is very limiter, limited anyway, it's a very small CPU, so... The, no, I was thinking if you could, if Rust enables you to use interrupt service routines. I have seen code that does it. Ah. There is one attribute that you need to give to the function so that the function actually, you know, when you write something extern C, it's extern something, and then the compiler understands that the ABI is interrupt service routine, uh -huh. and then you can actually use it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? So how does your son feel about Rust concurrency? <laughs> okay, so initially he was scared. Uh, because I was clear with him up front, I, I explained to him the issue with memory management uh, and uh, the point that he was not exposed to see like errors, but he had the borrow checker. And uh, initially he was resisting because he said, oh, crap, Golang is so simple. And in my opinion, he's right, by the way. Golang is exceptional as a programming language for the simplicity. Uh, but right now, as far as I know, he's at home adapting the code of one robot to another robot in Rust. Uh, so that's it. <laughs> there was another question there. That's okay. the last question, probably, if there's time. Uh, yes, we have a, uh, yeah, we can recover some time for questions. Um, you said that there was, uh, sorry, in, in your second to last slide, you are talking about the difficulties with preempt RT. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, okay, so the problem is that uh, Linux is not a real-time operating system, which means that sometimes you enter the kernel and you have no idea when you will get out of it. And as I said, this is not good. Now, uh, ov over, the, over time, there has been a patch maintained over the kernel, which is called the real-time patch, that adds real-time features to the kernel, bringing it to almost real-time status. It's not perfect, because it's, it's, it's not been designed from the start to do that, but it's almost there. I am aware of cases where, for some, so if you have a Raspberry Pi, a quad-core one, 
I know that people have essentially dedicated one core of the four to a single process that does nothing else than answering to interrupts from an SPI line. And this, in my opinion, is a very, very interesting concept. So you have a, have a very high level operating system. On the other cores, you can even run a web server. But on this core, it's a, essentially it's real time working on a single serial line. Now probably on this SPI, you are going to talk to another CPU, which is a real time one, which does the real thing. But then it's, it's sensible because you can write high level logic like a web, web interaction server, which is totally soft real time. You really don't care there. But then you can interface with the real things. So that, that's the, the route I would take there. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Be done here. Go under a round of applause, Massimiliano. <laughs> <laughs>